Hello, everyone. We are live, and we have Ken Seeley from Intervention on the line with us. Thank you, Ken, for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Yes, and um, so so you have been doing Intervention for how long? Oh my gosh, it's been years since the show's been on the air. Yeah, I filmed my first one in 2005, I think it was, something like that, years ago. Wow. Um, yes, and so right now you are filming a series in Vegas. Uh, Vegas just ended and it's airing right now, and then the next one will be um, California, I think. I'm not sure where they're doing the next one, but um, we got a next season picked up, so that's exciting. Um, well, this is just so great. We're all very excited and we're big fans of the show. Um, it, I mean, it's just so powerful to see people that may not be as strong uh, to overcome addiction on their own. And so you guys step in and you're that beacon of light to help them navigate through a lot of which is traumas that they haven't dealt with. And I know I reached out to you, Ken, about five years ago with my own addictions and you just gave me all these resources. And I did go to rehab several times. Yeah, and it didn't work out for me, but I ultimately learned that I had to do the work on my own. Uh, so that is a, a very important element of uh, just getting rid of addiction and, and overcoming those barriers in itself. So yes, we would love to hear more from you. We have you featured on our screen and, and uh, all the amazing accomplishments. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. Yay. So, so tell us a little bit about what stemmed you know, you to start the show intervention, maybe some background there in terms of uh, real, what really turns you into who you are today in the show itself. That's okay. Um, yeah, sure. No, I know I, I didn't start the show. A guy named Sam Mettler started the show. Um, he was the founding producer. So a good friend of mine, love him to death. Um, I'm one of the lucky, fortunate um, featured interventionists on the show. And like you said, I've been doing it since 2005 when I aired, aired my first one. So what is that, 16 years ago? Holy cow. Getting old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly don't look uh, the age. So that's that must be, you must have some health principles in there too, Ken. What is, the, what is your diet? I'm curious. I've never researched any of that. Um, well, you know, I... I I've been in recovery myself for, since July 14th, 1989. So um, I think just the healthy lifestyle is really what it's all about, is making healthy choices. And, you know, every day I walk, you know, two miles to up a hill from my house here and walk the dog up there and, you know, really try to take care of myself, eating the right foods, no sugar, no carbs, um, no sodas, none of that stuff. Um, and if I'm going to work that hard to not do drugs and alcohol, why wouldn't I, you know, for my, my mental well-being, why wouldn't I take care of my physical well-being also? Exactly. That, you know, exercise is such a, an important element of, of health in itself. And I know uh, that's been kind of emphasized in the show itself that, that I've seen, you know, some uh, addictions that stem around diet as well. Uh, there's just so many elements to addiction. It's not limited to drugs and alcohol in itself. So I would love to hear your input on that as well. Yeah, you know, um, addiction really isn't, I love it. You know, this is about you know, uh, prescription drugs and other drugs that are out there, you know, pharmaceuticals, but really the disease itself is a mind disease, you know, um, from from my perspective of, of how it affected me and how it affected millions of others is that number one, it's in the genes of the family system. Somebody in the family, you know, has this disease. And um, so it's not a chosen lifestyle, like um, so many people try to make well, in the past, I don't think it's as much in the, in the present, 
But in the past, it was always like, oh, those are the weak people. Those are the people that can't stop on their own. And really, nobody chooses to um, become a drug addict. You know, when I was in, you know, first, second grade, when they were asking me, what did I want to be when I grew up? I said, I wanted to be a doctor, not a junkie on the streets doing crystal meth. Um, so it wasn't a choice that I became, became a junkie on the streets doing crystal meth. It was my disease. So first it is a gene within the body and within the, um, in the family dynamics, just like diabetes. And then from there, it takes some form of trauma that ignites the gene. You know, it breaks it open. And once it's ignited and you do drugs and alcohol, um, it numbs the trauma. So when you combine the gene and the trauma and then you break it open, now you feel comfortable in your own skin um, from without doing the work around the trauma. And that's where addiction just goes skyrocketing. It just flies up and takes over people's lives. And it, you know, being an interventionist for so many years, the part that breaks my heart is the addict, yes, they're numbing and self-medicating their trauma, but the families are not medicated. They're not numbing, and they're feeling the pain of watching their loved ones kill themselves. That's what breaks my heart. Yeah, and you know, a lot, a lot of the people, you know, the family members, they have unresolved issues themselves, and enabling is such a it's such an apparent factor and and you know i i've seen it all around me in my life i grew up with a lot of traumas and you know fortunately i wasn't in an enablement situation my husband's like you need to get better like now (laughs) but you know it's not the case yeah that's just not the case that's not the reality because when when you're being enabled by someone uh, in a family member typically they're not healed themselves right Yeah, and enabling, I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, on my last episode that I did on the show two weeks ago was the season um, premiere. Um, And it it showed how it's a family disease. I mean, it was riddled everywhere. It was like a house of horrors. You know, the sister, the brother, the mother, you know, um, the, the person that we intervened on. So there was a whole family system that had this disease And part of the disease, if you look at the dad, the enabling, the need to have somebody need you in that way is just as powerful as the disease itself. Does that make sense? It does. So when you look at that dad, you know, he was addicted to taking care of his family. So it made him feel validated and loved when they needed him. So when you talk about people that are enablers, you know, I really want them to really dig deep inside and say, is it worth nursing my loved one to death to fulfill a void that I need that's being fulfilled by them needing me? Does that make sense? Yes, Yes, it does. And you know, curiosity out of all of that too. You know, are there any additional elements? Um, you know, maybe in the enablement is one factor, but what else could kind of you know cause addiction to to really fuel them getting into those behaviors? You know, some of these people you see and you're just like, how do they let it go that far? How how do they lose control? Where can they just say? you know, it, enough is enough. Well, that's the point. It's not the person's choice. They, they don't say enough is enough until they feel enough discomfort. You know, I've never met in the 31 years of being in recovery, someone say, oh, I got into recovery because I just got a raise at work or I got engaged yesterday. So I'm going to go to, you know, my treatment center. You know, th- people don't do that. They don't check into treatment because of that reason. They check into treatment because they felt some pain or discomfort in their lives. That's what motivates people. So the environment around them doesn't create enough pain in their lives to motivate them to want to change. 
And that's the enabling part. You know, they pay for the attorney to get them out of that legal consequence that they had. They, you know, they continue to give them money, even though they know that they're buying drugs and alcohol with that money. So that enabling is what, let's say we had a little campfire burning right here. And in that campfire, we kept throwing twigs on it. That's what families are doing. The disease is sitting there growing and they keep throwing twigs on it. And some families are throwing logs on it. I mean, they're making it explode and they don't realize that they're doing it. But the environment is the only thing that will help either continue the disease to grow or to help put it out, one or the other, the environment. Wow, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for provo providing all of that uh, information. So well summarized, too, and gives us such an in-depth view of what ad addiction is really about. Um, can we go to the next slide? And I think so. We, we came up with a bunch of statistics about you know prescription drug abuse and i know that's something that we kind of wanted to put the spotlight on today if you will because um it's just so widely available and i don't think doctors mean for that to happen i think you know it's just me being in, in a position myself five years ago where I was like, you know, just complaining and nagging my doctors. Like, I need more. I need, you know, I'm in pain. I'm suffering. And you guys need to help me. Like, this is unacceptable. You're my doctor. I'll just get a new doctor. You know, like those those threats that come about. Um, well, what is your what is your viewpoint on, on prescription drugs and just the industry of, of that in itself? Well, there are some drug, uh, I was going to call them drug dealers, uh, doctors that are drug dealers. And, you know, I have one right now with a client at my treatment center. I have a treatment center in Palm Springs, California. And the client is in my treatment center and he was showing me the text that he just texts his doctor. Oh, I have this. I need this. I have that. I need this. I, he's telling his doctor the medication that he needs. And the doctor's just sending this prescription to the pharmacy. So I would call that a legal drug dealer. I mean, they should be put in prison. I, I mean, it's criminal what they're doing, some of these physicians out there. If somebody is coming to a physician like you were, right? Remember what you just said? Yes. <laughs> Go to the doctor. I need this. I'll, I'll fire you if you don't get me this. They should be put on a blacklist. Of, that Everything is computerized now. Come on. It can't be that difficult. That your name should be on a blacklist at any time you try to get medication from a doctor, you need to go directly to a psychiatrist and an addictionologist to make sure that you're not addicted before they give you any more medication for your pain. So it should be, you know, all computerized, all interactive, where people could see, I think they're getting a little bit better today in, in modern times. And I think in today's world, you know, doctors are getting in trouble. I've seen a lot of doctors go to jail for this, so I'm grateful for that. But they're not really taught addiction. They're kind of, well, I don't want to lose that patient. And she's threatened to leave me to go to that guy down the street. And I'm doing her insurance, so I'm going to try to keep her happy. So keeping you happy, yet making sure that you're safe, I think, is the most important part. So the prescription drugs, we really got to, I know the last three to five years, we've been doing a better job on hammering down on those docks and getting those drug mills shut down. But I think we still have to do some work because that guy is in our treatment center today and he just showed me all the texts on his phone. He's saying, you know, here's what I say to my doctor and this is what he gives me. So it's still going on. Wow. Yeah, and you know, just kind of uh, emphasizing all of that, I, I do know, you know, with, with doctors, and I, I have a psychiatrist too, and when going to see him, he would call me out and stuff, but I would work yeah. my way around him. I'd work my way around him, like, well, you're not the boss of me just because you're my psychiatrist. So I would, you know, try to find all these, you know, Kaiser is a big uh, medical. Uh, you know, 
you know, <laughs> they're, they're huge. So you could switch doctors, uh, you could just, you know, get around that all day long. Um, so is that something you commonly see as well? Yes, and that's what I'm talking about. If Yeah, you, you could do that, but imagine, imagine if it was in the computer system next to your name that all of the people in Kaiser could see or all physicians, it should be open in that open database that you're red flag as a possible drug seeking patient, um, then boom, immediately they would be alerted to know that, hey, I'm not gonna give her mind altering substances. I'm gonna get her into a place that's gonna help her with whatever her pain is but not getting her on drugs. So now imagine if you were red flagged in the computer and now you said, damn crap, that crap doesn't work anymore. I can't threaten to go to another doctor. Then what would you have done? No, that makes sense. Wow, thank you so much for, for just emphasizing on that. Uh, I'm gonna let the team step in. I feel like I've done a lot of talking and I know they all wanna interview you. They have questions. Um, there we go. Hi, Ken. So we have a couple questions lined up for you. And first of all, I want to say thank you for taking the time to provide some great insight with your experience. Um, so for the first question we have, um, how are drug and prescription interventions started and why? How are drug interventions started? Yes. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know, drug intervention started because, um, you know, they started seeing the abuse, like she was saying earlier about going to a doctor and getting the medications. And then all of a sudden, you know, your loved one is overdosed again and again and again. And the families are like, oh my God, I have to do something. I can't continue to sit there watching them die. So they started reaching out to professionals like myself. You know, we, I have interventionists all over the country, actually all over the world I have interventionists. I started training interventionists in London 15 years ago. So um, we have people all over the country, all over the world, and they realize that, oh my God, I don't know what to do, and they call out for a professional. Got it, okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, Ken. Um, just wanted to thank you for coming on today. And we're also grateful for you to come. Um, so our second question is, how can a patient's family get involved to help them in their journey to recovery? Um, I think it's a big one. Just, I believe family to be my biggest support system as for a lot of people. So I guess, yeah, how, how could a family help uh, someone's journey to recover? Oh, I love that question. How can a family help um, when they have a loved one suffering from an addiction? That's it, right? So if you have a loved one suffering from addiction, um, I think it's really important to know that the number one symptom of this disease is denial. That's the number one symptom. So if they're suffering from this disease and the number one symptom is denial, then you have to be the one to step up to the plate as the family member because they don't see it. It's not clear to them because that's the number one symptom. You know, you get into later symptoms where the disease continues to grow and get worse, but the beginning stages of the disease, that's the number one symptom that's consistent while you're trying to manage your use and control your use. That is the number one symptom is denial. So it takes an outside individual to break down that wall of denial. And that's what an intervention is. So everybody that gets sober, they tell me that someone that loves them in their lives recognized something was wrong. And then they decide to get help because they started to chip away at the, the wall of denial. So really great question. If you have a loved one that's suffering, realize they're not going to hit a rock bottom on their own. It's going to take either getting locked up and going to jail. It's going to take um, overdosing. 
it's going to take um, with these prescription drugs. You know, it's a lot of overdosing with that. It's going to take them switching from prescriptions to heroin or op- all kinds of things that they do. But that's what it's going to take for them to hit a rock bottom. So why wouldn't you as the family member to say, hey, I see a lot of red flags going on. You know, I'll, 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 I'll wrap it up with this one is my colleague, John Southworth, that passed away years ago. He used to always tell me that um, he goes, if you're driving your car down the road and, you know, how many of you do this? Like the, the, the warning light goes on and you still drive. And then all of a sudden now the next warning light goes on and you still drive. And then the next warning light goes on and you still drive. I used to do that for years. Number one, I didn't have the money to fix it. So I would just <laughs> you know, keep driving and, um, and thinking, oh, it'll go away. Or I'll put some you know, radiator fluid in and that'll stop it. Add some water in there and that'll stop it. So, but what happens with families they don't contact an interventionist until all the red lights are on, all the warning signs are there, and they're in major, major crisis mode. I'm asking you, when you see the first warning sign light go on, to take advantage of that and take action and contact a professional. That's the most important thing that you could do. Get advice from a professional the minute the first warning sign goes on, because I guarantee you, all of them are going to go on. It's going to end up into a major crisis. And if any of you want to share about that, how uh, you might have loved ones or family members or friends that you've seen, them, or maybe even like yourself, like me, I went through it myself. All the warning signs were there, but I didn't take it until I got fired from my job. And that was the motivator that got me into recovery. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Any experiences? Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. Come on, let's open this up. I actually do. Um, my boyfriend's family, his mom and brother and sister are all addicts. And um, it's really tough to just see the family dynamic and see the enabling that's going on. Um, and you know, he, he doesn't abuse any drugs and it's really tough to see sometimes. Cause you know, I, I see that there's love there, but it's also very, it, it affects the relationship that they all have. Um, so yeah, I'm going to show him this, um, live stream after. <laughs> And also ask them to watch ep- uh, season 22, episode one. So it aired two weeks ago. Watch that episode of Intervention because most there's one sister that wasn't an addict, but the rest of the family was. And, you know, it took that one sister to reach out and the other family members to, you know, there's some family members that are in recovery, but a lot of them, you know, were in active addiction. So it's going to take... Your, him to break the cycle, if you want to say that. I mean, he's, he's going to have to have a lot of strength to break the cycle in the family system. Yes, thank you, Ken. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Amazing. Does anyone else want to share anything? No? Well, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you so much for your time here. I'm able to see a lot of empathy in your talking. I mean, the way you respect your patients. Um, um, you know, like I'm a counseling psychologist. I have actually uh, worked as a volunteer in the in the halfway homes in Singapore. So, um, you know, like I can I can instantly connect to you uh, because you know, like your words are having so much empathy for your patients. So it's a lot. Thank you so very much for representing that. Um, um, so otherwise, like, you know, like without this energy, you wouldn't be carrying this for so many years. Um, so like, I really admire that. I just see your works. So I really admire what you're doing. So um, I, I had my brother who had like, you know, addiction issues. And initially, like there was a lot of like, you know, like cultural things around that. 
um so like uh, they didn't know it's a it's a mind disease or something i was very young i was not able to help my mom, a brother so the only thing my family was uh, telling me is like you know like i have to keep 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 myself away from him so that like i don't get that habit or something it was so hurting for that guy so like you know like i realized it's wrong so i went i went up to a doctor at that age i think like i was 8 years or something i went up to the doctor and i was asking him like what's really happening with him so even i'm i'm telling you the doctor didn't have you know like he's I, I really believe those words. I cannot believe like you know, a doctor was saying that to me because now the now the research and all that like and and um, you kind of people are bringing a lot of awareness. Probably those people didn't have the awareness, and so like many years, my my brother underwent this like you know like the cultural uh, you know negligence, um, the family neglecting him. Yes, love was there, but still you know like the family was afraid of him. others were like you know like afraid to bring their children to my home so this happened for many years but i saw him like recover like when you know like someone like you came into his life and said like this is a mind disease so like it, he can be cured and so like spirituality helped him a lot also so i would like to ask you like what's the role of spirituality in this um uh, in this healing process can what is the what uh, the role of spirituality the world the role of spirituality uh -huh. Oh my god it's huge. So well first of all I'm you know so grateful that you stuck by his side because you know a lot of people and and Alanon will teach you you know cut them off you know cut them off and you know and I do cut people off but I always give them the option get into recovery and you could be a part of the family. But if you're choosing not to be a part into recovery then I have to cut you off. It's not a choice I'm making. it's a choice you're making so i i really i'm really glad you brought that up because it would break my heart when people would just say cut them off and don't even you know don't communicate that there's an option of getting into recovery and being a part of the family because it is a mind disease your brother didn't choose to be that way nobody chooses to be that way oh yeah um but the spirituality part of recovery is huge I mean it is uh it's got to be like you got to get to your you, you got to get to a point where the pain is so intense where you get the air knocked out of you and you say um oh my god I can't do this anymore I can't do this anymore I I'm going to die if I continue going this way and you start asking for that power power greater than yourself somebody to come in and help help you because i can't do it i've been trying to figure it out for so long like for so many years you know i was always bullied as a little kid that was my trauma so from 4 to 14 i was used to getting beat up and picked on in school constantly every single day i was picked on so that pain of being bullied every day and that that experience made me put a coat of armor on where to protect myself so i would i would feel comfortable in my own skin and then when i did drugs and alcohol i finally didn't care about people making fun of me and i was able to drink and feel normal so now you're telling me you're going to take away my drugs and alcohol and um and that's the only thing i know that's like my oxygen that's the only thing that makes me feel comfortable in my skin so now you're going to take that away from me it's like it's like almost inhumane and a lot of people that's why when they get sober they think of suicide because they're still in that pain and they didn't deal with the trauma but the point about your question about spirituality is in our program that i work and that we work in our program you, you know in the 12 steps of alcoholics anonymous it teaches us how to find your own spirituality maybe it's not the one that you were brought up with maybe it is it doesn't matter but you find your own spirituality and i love this one because with 10 years sober in a 12 step program i switched addictions to love addiction and money addiction and so even though i wasn't drinking and using I still was obsessed over money and a relationship making me feel better and here. And so I went to this therapist and yet he, he was a doctor and he he said to me he goes the missing link that you're missing is meditation. 
meditation is what you're missing. He goes, do you pray? I was like, I pray all the time. I, taught, I learned 10 years ago how to pray in, in the program. So my spirituality was really strong in praying, but I wasn't meditating. And so he gave me this, oh my God, they're all over my house. There's one right back there. You can see him over by the door. Um, yeah, see it right there? There he is. See him right there? The, he's back there. It's a Ganesha. And he goes, pray to Ganesha. Ganesha has four hand arms and Ganesha will remove all the obstacles. Anytime you feel discomfort or um, anxiety or fear, any of that, just meditate to Ganesha and ask Ganesha to take away the obstacles. And I did that. And while through that process, I grew my own company. I grew, got on the TV show. I mean, all through meditation. And people were like, what university did you go to to learn how to be a, such a successful business person? I was like, number one, I don't feel like I'm even successful. I still feel like I, I, I'm nowhere near successful. And But yet, I have accomplished a lot. And I, I tell them, the success came from meditating, listening to that spirituality, that voice from a higher power, and asking Ganesha to clear the path. So when you go to that level of your recovery, um, the strength of your recovery is magnified by a million. So I hope that answers your question. Is it's a huge part of recovery. Thank you, thank you so very much, Ken. I I never thought I would like hear Ganesha from you. I never thought about that. I'm a huge Ganesha devotee, so I never thought like you know like I will hear that from you. The the sort of like meditation that heals the existential aloneness because that is where like people become like this. And I can very much relate to what relate to what you are saying because when my 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 brother became sober, he got the suicidal ideation. He started attempting suicides. So I I I still remember my father was still oh one thing is healed and he picked up another thing so you know like i used to because it is not that like you know like uh, my my father is not lovable or something but he was not able to handle that um so like you know um somehow like you know like we but as you say like only meditation only meditation and his spirituality um so like it actually healed him otherwise like you know like he we could have gone nowhere in life yeah thank you so very much Ken. thank you so much i love that <laughs> And Ganesha's in every room in our house, one there, one there. <laughs> every room I have a Ganesha now. So when they ask me, oh, Ganesha did it. You know, Ganesha gave me my success. And they're like, oh, I'm going to pray to Ganesha. <laughs> I said, it works. Awesome. Um, awesome to know again. Thank you so very much. Thank you. That's amazing. I have Ganesha in my house all over. The, I have him in the background behind me and uh, in the living room. And we have a lot of people from... Uh, India, all walks of life on the team. So I know that's a big influence for them. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, does anybody have, we have another question here. And uh, who, who, Luna, were you gonna, who was gonna do that question? I'll go ahead and do it. Okay. <laughs> Hi Ken, thanks again for being here. And the third question is, um, what are some keys to success to generating a successful intervention program? Personally, I've had experience with um, my siblings having addictions and I've seen them like go to intervention and just what makes the difference between a successful program? Cause I've seen some of them come out and go right back to it. And I've seen other ones go to different programs and like stick to it. So what is it to you that makes it like a successful program? Oh, great question. So in my per perception of a successful program, number one is that it has family involvement. And I don't mean family involvement where you know, you go to a weekend seminar or you go there for a week and do a thing. At our treatment center, every single person that goes through it, the families come to a therapy session every Tuesday and an Al-Anon meeting every um, Thursday. So the family is involved in the intervention process. And then what we do is we do a family realignment. And what that means is we understand what are the five most important things in the person with addiction in their lives, and then how do we use those to keep them motivated to staying in recovery. So getting the family involvement, um, there's some really, really successful programs, the doctor diversion programs, the pilot programs, nurses programs, 
every one of them have a board that monitors them for five years. So if you have a board monitoring you and you're a part of that program, then what it tells you is that you have to be compliant to your recovery. And if you're non-compliant, there's a consequence. So understanding a treatment center has to understand that consequences motivate us and carrots keep us going. So you need the carrot and the stick approach. So here's the carrot up here and you're reaching up. You need to have the, the, the stick to keep you on track. So that's one component that I think is really important is having the family involvement. And the second one is having the family involvement that's all unified. Because I always look at it like if you have a, a wild stallion that is a horse in the middle of a corral, and all of the family members are holding their hands, holding their hands together, and the horse is running in circles. It's going to run in circles until it gets tired. But the minute one of you drop your hand, boom, the minute you drop your hand, the horse is going to go running, and you're going to have to go catch it again. So that's the same thing with this disease. The minute that one family member drops their and goes into codependency, now we're starting all over again. But if we could educate the families that they have to stay united, they have to stay connected, then the disease will not take off, then that makes a really good treatment center because we're educating the family. I always say, because I've been doing interventions for so many years, I always say, you know, um, the family has the golden key. They just don't know how to activate it. They've had it for all these years, they just don't know how to activate it. And a successful intervention and treatment is teaching the family how to activate that kid. So I think that's the difference. And again, I think the second difference would be is the person hitting their rock bottom. Because like I said, I, 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 I call it the addict's hustle. We have a hustle that works for us, like being bullied from 4 to 14. I had a hustle that worked for me. It kept me safe. But that addict's hustle that I do isn't going to save my life. That's going to kill me, that addict's hustle. That addict's hustle is going to put me in my grave. So I need a punch in the gut to say Ken's way doesn't work anymore. Ken's way doesn't work anymore. And so going into treatment, it's if the person had a hard enough punch in the gut to say, I surrender to God, I surrender to the program, I surrender to my therapist, whatever, I surrender. When they say they surrender, that's when they get into recovery. So if they haven't felt enough pain, those are the ones that, you know, and this is the problem. This is the problem with a lot of people going to treatment and why the success rate is only three to 7% is because they go in because their spouse says, I'm going to divorce you if I don't, if you don't go to treatment, I'm done. I'm getting a divorce. And then they go to treatment for 30 days. They come out of treatment. And then I, like you said earlier, you manipulated your doctors, you know, now they manipulate their family and say, Oh, look, I look better. I smell better. You know, um, I'm doing so much better. Thank you so much for having me go to treatment for 90 days. And I'm going to do this really well. But the consequence isn't there anymore. So once they know you're not looking anymore and the consequence isn't there, boom, they're off and running again. And they're, they're back into their addiction. So that's what, why we have to keep that carrot and a stick there for a long time. It's not a, there's no immediate fix in this disease. Yeah, I want to show my Ganesha. So, oh, 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 <laughs> so yeah. I have a huge one. <laughs> so I he's my favorite him. one. Yeah. So I know you would love him. <laughs> I love him, love him, love him. I got the same oh, yes. one almost in silver on my kitchen. And then okay. as you open my front door, there's a gigantic one, like four feet tall. Sure. <laughs> so thank you so much. I love that one. Oh, my God. Beautiful. Yep. <laughs> thank you so much, Ken. Uh, thank you for sharing them. You guys are so, this has just been so amazing. I know we've heard your phone going off the hook in the background there. So um, I would, I'm not sure. I think we're, 
we have this last question and i know we had luna and miko and anya do you do any of you would you like to um yeah I, i'll ask the question um so hi ken i also just wanted to thank you again for taking the time to be here with us and speaking with us so as you're all aware we are in the middle of a pandemic right now and people's lives have adjusted and shifted in so many different ways i was wondering how has COVID 19 affected training programs and intervention programs with patients Ooh, that's a good question and um recovery one of the most important things in recovery is teaching connection because when you have trauma you don't trust people, so it's always about the trauma creates separation. So the human bond that we need, that every human being craves, even if they don't think they crave it, we all crave it, becomes separated because, because we've been uh, abused, we've been, you know, there's some trauma, uh, traumatic experience that has happened in our life, so we keep ourselves separated from other humans just to stay safe. And this pandemic that we're going through right now, the pandemic is, um, is creating a huge separation for all of us. So now that we already have the disease that we, you know, we're, we're creating separation, the pandemic is now keeping us this far apart. So how do we bring it back together is the, what I hear the question to be, is how do we build connection in this crisis time. I mean, last year we were the busiest we ever been in our treatment center, which just breaks my heart because I mean, people are suffering right now because of the disconnection. So they're using drugs and alcohol to numb the emptiness, the loneliness, and it's keeping, you know, treatment centers full. But um, how do we bridge that gap right now? Um, thank God for the internet because I go to internet me I 5 a.m. I'm gonna be secretarying a meeting tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. my time. You know, I'm gonna be on um, a Zoom 12-step meeting. Um, this past year, we've been training interventionists. We do a training for interventionists, how to learn to become a training, an interventionist, and we do five mods. And in those five mods, um, they used to always be in person, but in 2020. We, were, we met with the credentialing board and we're able to do them online now. So we started doing them. So every month we're doing them online. So we're educating people to become uh, interventionists online and we're able to build communities online where even though I'm not in person with these people that I go to see, I mean, there's a meeting every day that's free on my website that anybody could go to. Um, an open 12 step meeting every day, three o'clock Pacific time. Um, but, but even though we don't have the in-person experience with this pandemic, we do have the availability to help each other with um, getting on this platform of, of, of the internet offers. Sorry, I didn't know your platform so well and I was a little late today, but all these platforms are saving a lot of people's lives and really take advantage of them is what I would recommend. It's amazing. Thank you so much. For Thank you a lot. Yay. Uh, Nico, did you want to go uh, next? Yes, so I also want to thank you because um, I also have relatives who had experienced addictions and it wasn't until one of them almost overdosed and until one of them got pregnant that they realized that um, they should have a change in their lives. And so with people who are in also your career and who ex exhibit a lot of patience and um, empathy, it really does make a difference with people who are struggling to do this by themselves. And so um, your presence here really does encourage others to, to like maybe take that step. Um, with uh, all of these presentations as well. And so I do have questions, two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, um, while there should be more restrictions when prescribing medications, wouldn't it be to some degree um, invalidating, invalidating the patient's experience of pain? Or is it more in the sense of creating barriers uh, for the sake of safety? Yeah, no, so the question is, um, is 
with all the people that are being prescribed medication, is it harming them by not giving them their medication? Is that correct? Um, it's more so along, uh, like you suggested, that there should be more open access between all physicians to see who's being prescribed what. And so if that does, um, if that were to take place and we start, or at least if the, phys the physicians start um, creating restrictions in the sense that um, because you were on this medication, we're not going to put you on this one, is that invalidating their pain? Because we can't experience their pain. No, no, that no. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because, I, you know, when people are dealing with pain management and they cross that line of addiction, you know, that, that line, um, it's so heartbreaking because I'm not saying people don't have pain. I mean, we cannot discredit their pain. That, that, that's criminal. You know, if we're going to say, oh, well, you have pain, but you're an addict, so you shouldn't really get any medication or deal with your pain, you know, so, um, you know, sorry, you can't, you don't get anything. But being a real, a real educated professional in this field that understands the disease concept, they will have other modalities to help them with pain. And people that have been taking pain meds for a long, long time, and they become addicted to those pain meds, the pain, I would say, in my experience, 80% um, of them are dealing with the pain of the detox that is so unbearable that they are saying, oh my God, I, don't, I can't live like this, I need another pill. But really, if they get through the hump of the detox and then really get a, a, a platform to really measure that pain from, you know, give, get an even ground of where we're starting from, get rid of the drugs and start the, the measuring the pain from an, a, a real level versus a detox level, if that makes sense. Because a lot of people, the pain that is coming in, 80% of them, the pain that their experience is, is coming off the medications. So now let's say we have somebody that's off all the medications. They're still feeling pain and discomfort. There's a lot of other modalities out there that today that do work. And there are other drugs that are non-addictive non that do work. So there's many other tools in their toolbox as a physician that they could come up with, chiropractic care, acupuncture, massage therapy. I mean, there's so many different things, um, different medications with, you know, there's a uh, meditation that's been very good to help with pain. Um, so I, once they try all of those, and if they still need some kind of pain medication, then really working closely with their physician on how to keep it because you know once you get on medication and for these pains the tolerance just keeps growing and growing growing your levels so you know what used to only take a half a pill now takes 10 pills to cover the, to mask that pain but now when you're coming off that pain it's not the pain of the original pain it's the pain of the detox so it's really having that empathetic doctor that knows how to measure each thing um, to really understand what's going on with their patient and not looking at them as a number because that's the most important. At our treatment center, we don't look at people as numbers. We look at them as individuals and each person is going to have a different experience with different medications and modalities. Thank you. And um, Nicole, did you have another uh, quick question or? Yeah, so really good. Um, and so I, I completely agree. I think that um, a lot of it has to do also with the fear of that detox that a lot of people tend to um, not get off of their pills and such. And so the second question I have is, have you noticed a trend or a change in trends um, through your through your line of work among prescription drug abuse among people of color, um, whether it be among teens, adults, or elderly people? Um, yeah, the prescription drug abuse, um, you know, the ages are so different right now. I mean, you're getting young kids that are getting addicted to, you know, the medication that is in their parents, you know, medicine cabinets and trying medication that they're getting at schools. 
so you're getting at young adults, you're getting at um, seniors. I mean, that's, that's the hardest one is because you think of somebody in a nursing home that's uh, addicted to pain meds and they're getting their daily dose, you know, um, they're the ones that break my heart the most because they don't think that they can change and they think that they're stuck in this and that this is just the rest of their lives. But in recovery, when you find other modalities, you could really enjoy those later years in your life and you don't have to be crippled. You know, like you said, um, you know, a lot of people go through this process and they, um, you know, they think that the detox process is going to, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's going to be easy. Pain, detoxing is painful. I would, you know, I wouldn't wish that on any single person out there because it is painful, but doing a detox under a medical supervision, they could give you medication for the nausea when you're starting to vomit, you know, the runs when you start having diarrhea, they could give you medication for the aches and pains that your bones are going to experience. So doing that with a physician and, and being medically supervised, we minimize that pain as minimal as possible. And then we could walk through it and get that platform. So, yeah, I don't care if you're young, old, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it hits all walks of life. It doesn't matter color. It doesn't matter religion. It doesn't matter. The only difference I do, I do acknowledge is different religions and different um, nationalities. They do have um, something like I'm, I'm you know, my, I'm half Puerto Rican. My mother's from Puerto, my, her family's from Puerto Rico. And, you know, the Hispanic community will keep things more secretive, you know, and to themselves that the family can handle it or religion can handle it. So I do notice different nationalities handling it in different ways. So absolutely, I do see that. But what I'm, my hope and prayer is, is that it doesn't matter what nationality you're, you come from, this disease is not prejudice and you have to have transparency. So please open up because through transparency can create health and wellness. Amazing, thank you so much. And wow, what, that's so informative. And uh, we are just all so excited and blessed to have had your time today. Uh, I do have Luna, uh, we'll have her come on and then we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. Cause we know you're busy, you have your 5 a.m. Hi Ken, thank, thank you, thank you for um, coming on. Um, I think it's really important that you were mentioning, you know, how it is a disease and it's not necessarily something that people can control. Um, but I think that is something that not a lot of people are aware of. I think people think like, oh, it's like totally under their control, like they did this to themselves. And there's just a lot of stigma around mental health and addiction in general. So my question is, how do we address that um, stigma that there is around mental health and addiction? I think it all starts with us, you know? I mean, how do we look at it individually? Um, every single person that I've ever talked to knows somebody that's suffering. So to break the stigma, we have to acknowledge that number one, it's not their choice. Like I said, you know, I, I don't care where you live in the world, there's a tent city down the street from your house. There's homeless people all over the world right now. And do you believe that that is somebody's little baby kid that was in their house that they bought up as a parent and do you believe that the parent or they said, oh, one day my dreams are to live in tent city? You know, nobody grows up thinking that. Not one human being, but yet we're, it's in every city in the world. It's happening. So if you look at that where nobody would ever dream to be living there and that would be their, you know, their, uh, their hopes and their prayers to one day accomplish something and that's what they accomplish is living in tent city but yet they're there the reason they're there is because of mental illness and addiction you know it's a disease is why they're there so it would be like people suffering from cancer if they all ended up in the streets 
how would you treat them? They didn't make the choice to have cancer. Would you just look at the other way as you're driving by Tent City? Or would you look at them and say, oh my God, that could be my kid. That could be my parent. That could be, you know, my cousin. That, that's somebody that I could know because I have this gene in my blood. I have this, this disease in my system. And just knowing that could help break the stigma that this is not a choice. This is not a choice. People are suffering out there every single day. I think just in America alone, there's over 25 million people suffering from it. So if you add their parents and their siblings, that's 75 to 100 million people suffering from it right now, today, just in America alone. So if you do it worldwide, just think of all the people that know it. You don't judge somebody because they have cancer. So we got to stop the judgment that it's their choice and they don't choose to be this way. And we got to support and help them get out of this. And that's when I said at the earlier, when you see the first red light go on in your car dash, don't wait until the engine's on fire and it's blowing up on the freeway um, to do something about it because then there's no turning around. That's the homeless people. That's, you know, you waited until the engine blew up. You see those red lights and take an assertive action to help save their lives. That will break the stigma, in my humble opinion. Thank you so much, Ken. How exciting. I mean, uh, just hearing all of uh, your, your insights and experience, we're truly inspired and we salute you for all that you do. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to spend with our team. And we look forward to having another session with you sometime in the future. And uh, again, just thank you for all that you do for the world. Thank you. And you, you know, you go ahead and if you want, play the clip of the next season, or the season that's airing right now, because, um, you know, we've only done two of the eight episodes that are going to be airing. So if you're around Monday nights on A&E, um, We'd love to have you tune in and check out the new season because it's a good one. Um, yes, we will that. we'll be sharing the, uh, the series across the Assuaged and we're always rooting for all the change that the Intervention Series makes on and the impact on lives. So thank you so much for just uh, really working so hard in doing all that. So, yay. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ken. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.